the book I want to discuss now is a very short work. It's a work by Meera Kandasamy. I think many in India, especially a word of her, she is uh, a somewhat controversial figure because she's quite outspoken. And she's a poet, a fiction writer, a translator, and an activist. And this is a book which will take two, three hours to read at most. The last part of it is a few poems. And the rest of it is a kind of a narrative and partially autobiographical account. The book is called The Order's War to Rape You. Tigresses in the Tamil Elam Struggle. Now, as most of you who are my listeners are aware, there was a brutal civil war in Sri Lanka that lasted for well over 20 years. It ended officially with the death of Prabhakaran, the leader of the LTTE, the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam in 2008. And as with so much that I've been reading in recent months, I'm reminded of a number of incidents having to do with the conflict in Gaza, the present ongoing conflict in Gaza. But what really came to mind when I was reading this book was the fact that Israel has on more than one occasion promised the people of Gaza security by sending them to a safer zone. Right? So we know that of one people million were pushed down south from northern Gaza when Israel commenced its invasion. And we know that there are no safe zones for them, for the people of Gaza. I don't call them Gazans for the simple reason that well over half the people in Gaza come from outside Gaza. Okay? But we can call them Gazans if, if some of you would rather do that. But the people of Gaza have repeatedly been assured of safe zones, and this assurance has been constantly violated. And this was, of course, one of the principal hallmarks of the last stage of that absolutely brutal civil war that was fought in Sri Lanka, wherever your sympathies might lie, whether it lies with the state of Sri Lanka or with the Tamils, and if you're inclined to see the conflict in religious terms, if it lies with Buddhists and rather than with Hindus or vice versa, and whether you're inclined to see this as largely an economic conflict, the gist of it, nevertheless, is this that there was brutality on both sides. But the reason that we are always concerned with the brutality from the state is because the state is supposed to be the guardian of rights. Of course, what has happened, not all too often, but happens invariably, because that's the nature of a modern state, is that the state is in fact the most egregious violator of rights. And I was reminded of all of this because in the last stages of the war, when thousands of Tamils were killed, and not just LTT people, but Tamilian people who were civilians, right? And there's, a, and there's an extraordinary film um, available, uh, on the, uh, 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 available online uh, called Sri Lanka's Killing Fields, a film made by Channel 4, um, which is really about uh, the massacres that took place and how the army converged 
upon Kilonochi, which was the administrative capital of uh, Tamil Elam. Um, this is at a time when Mahindra Rajapaksa was the capital. Um, and in fact, uh, Kilonochi uh, was surrounded in September 2008 and fell in January 2009. Uh, ironically, the Sri Lankan uh, uh, Air Force uh, had uh, uh, planes imported from Israel. Uh, so, you know, there's another ironical little fact over there. Uh, the government had, in fact, drawn a large number of civilians into this area with the assurance that there would be zero civilian casualties. And in fact, the very hospital in Kilonochi was on 26 January 2009 destroyed by the Sri Lankan army. They committed a massacre there after the people had given an assurance that it was a safe zone. Now, this little book only goes into that very marginally because the book is fundamentally really about the tigresses, the women, and the movement. And of course, wherever there are women in these situations, you have to take it, unfortunately, as the default that they're going to be vulnerable to rape, right? The orders were to rape you. So let me, let me go back now to the beginning and say a little bit about the book. I'm going to be quite brief. It's a very short book. Uh, this is a book which has three major female characters. The writer who herself is a Tam Tamil Dalit feminist, poet, activist, right? And there's a Tamil tigress and a Tamil tiger's wife who herself was not a member of the tigers, right? The guerrilla force of this Tamil Ila, right? The idea being to create, this was a secessionist movement and the idea was to create a separate homeland within um, for, for the, these Tamils within Sri Lanka. And she describes her book as a book, which is an, an essay and the exercise in intimacy, right? It's a book about trauma, about writing, about the violence of men and the violence of armies and the violence of women and violence against women. That's what this book is fundamentally about. So she talks a little bit about how the conflict got escalated. Um, and the role of the Indian so-called peacekeeping force, uh, uh, the Indo-Sri Lanka Peace Accord of 1987. Um, and again, there are many ironies there because the army, the Indian army in part trained the LTTE and then subsequently hunted them down, right? Uh, this again is not surprising. It's ironical, but it's not surprising because this has happened all too often uh, uh, when, when countries have been invited in countries that were uh, you know, in this case, a regional power, which is what India was, nothing more than that at most, but we know that this has often been the problem uh, when the United States and uh, in the much earlier days when the Soviet Union uh, were called in. Um, and uh, you would get into these kinds of situations where they would train, uh, uh, you know, uh, either, either insurgent forces uh, uh, or fund revolutions or counter revolutions. <laughs> Um, and and then uh, they would have to take them down, right? So th this is a, a rather common uh, situation. Now, uh, women, she points out, were one third of the tiger fighting force. Uh, many of you will surely recall the assassination of Rajiv Gandhi. And you will recall uh, that a tigress, uh, a tiger woman had walked up to him, as I recall, with a bouquet of flowers. I think this was back in 19, if my memory doesn't fail me, I think he was assassinated in 87 or 88. Um, and she had walked to him and she had strapped, you know, a bomb to her and it exploded and he was killed as well. 
Uh, we know that we know that there were lots of women fighters in the uh, Tamil forces. Uh, but this is what makes this book a bit more interesting than just another ordinary account of the conflict and the role of women. Because what she is trying to suggest is that, you know, we have to understand the sensibility of these women and the culture that they came from. We lived in a Tamil society. And remember, she herself is Tamil, where girls were expected to conform to the four quintessential feminine qualities of Acham, Madam, Nanam, and Payerupu. You'll have to forgive my Tamil pronunciation. Fear, ignorance, modesty, shrinking delicacy. So the supposition that 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 these women would now actually join a guerrilla force and start wielding rifles and be trained, all of this really came as a huge surprise to many people because these were women who didn't conform, right? And this is how she typically writes. It, so here she's speaking about, so following that same paragraph uh, over there, Young girls like me were carrying AK-47s right, across the Pog Strait, the meager 20 miles of ocean which separated the states of Tamil Nadu and Tamil Elam. Young girls like me were carrying AK-47s and killing the enemy. And here I was, cowering under the bed in fear of my father, waiting with a belt in his hand because a boy in my class had dared to phone me at home. So she's saying this is what Tamil girls were like. In Tamil Nadu, and 20 miles away in Sri Lanka, these Tamil women were carrying AK 47s. Right? It became easier to forget our own restrictions if we could identify with these warriors who appear to us like living legends, so real and near, yet somehow distant and mythical. It became easier to bear our situation when armed with the knowledge. Then in a place not far away, Tamil girls just shot the fuck out of anyone who snatched their rights. It was thrilling to lust after the smoking hot Shea Guevara with his beret and his stubble, equally thrilling to lust after these incredibly brave women. Right? Um, yeah, she has a she has a fluency in the language, she has a racy style, but what she's suggesting is something very substantive that, you know, how do women from such a society get transformed into becoming guerrilla fighters, into becoming part of a professional fighting force, really, right? How did they remove themselves from their domestic domesticity? And yet did they? Because this is part of what she's talking about is that you know, when the conflict was over, when the Tamils lost, these same women, when they returned back to their, the ones who survived, the ones who returned to their village, to their home, they were snubbed. Nobody would even look at them. They had become disgraced. And it wasn't only the ones who had been raped who had become disgraced, because being raped means, of course, that you've got a stigma attached to you now, right? It was, it was almost as though they had never fought in the war and earned their stripes. And of course, there are variations of this, this forcible return to domesticity for women. After World War II in a number of countries in the United States, for example, women became very important in the production of munitions in the armaments industry because the men were away at the front, particularly after, 1943 44, when a huge number of American men were fighting the war. So the women had to come out of their homes. They had to, they had to, they had to work in the industries and in manufacturing, sometimes even in retail shops. Right. But then when the men came back at the end of the war, the women were pushed back into domesticity, into the kitchen. And it happened with these guerrilla women as well. Now, what, what is it 
that the title is about, right? So she talks about about the fact that there was, um, uh, 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 the, 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 that the largest camp for internally displaced people in the world was set up in Sri Lanka. Okay, and this is where many many of these uh, the Manik Farm Camp. Uh, this is a rehabilitation camp. It was called, um, and some of the women. It's called a rehabilitation camp. the The women who went there, some of the women, perhaps the greater majority of them, were brutally raped. Right. So she 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 furnishes an instance, and this is now the story. This is not. Mina Kandasamy's story. Remember that there are three female characters. There's herself. There's the tiger gorilla's wife, who was herself not a tiger, who eventually sought asylum in Europe. She too was raped, she says, right? And she talks about how women were raped, right? And then there was a female tiger. And she was raped in this camp. And the author of this book discusses very briefly how we are to interpret their fate, right? So now this is the story being told by this female tiger, okay? I was asked, the tigers took care of my basic needs. They let me study. They trained me when I turned 18 to be a combatant. There were no violations. This is her earlier life. Then she says, I surrendered in April 2009. I surrendered along with other people who surrendered. I told the army that I was at Bani on work. I was asked to go to the camp, black in Babunia. We were in a girls-only camp. The rapes started before the war even formally ended. The first rape happened on 5th May 2009. That was two weeks before the final days of the war. The rapists, everyone from a top army official to the low level soldiers wanted a piece of my flesh. The camp is where it all begins. No, the rapes do not wait. It does not begin after the war. There is no patience. My people were braving bombs and here I was being raped. I did not go into rehabilitation. Rehab was risky. Okay. And she keeps on speaking about that. Right. She says the days on which she was raped exceeded the days on which she was not. How did that work? I was meant to go when they called me. Why not? They had it all figured out. They knew I had lied. That is that they knew that she had been a tigress. She said she hadn't been. You could only have been a fighter. No one else was in the Vani. Right? And now the author is speaking. Partially. It's partially. It's partially. So this is one of the one of the narrative strategies. It's a very skillfully done because you know that the that the author is the narrator, the author here is empathizing with this female tiger, right? But it's partially her voice and it's partially her voice. Right? Why these rapes? I asked them too, just as you ask me now. They wanted the wombs of our women to bear their children. That's what they said during the rapes, right? So this is, of course, one of the ways this, the, the, you know, there, there are many interpretations which I won't get into of, of the, the act of rape. It's not just simply sexual lust or sexual domination. That's part of the story. It's, it's not simply a position of power. That's part of the story, of course, as well. But this idea that the woman has within her the seed of the next generation. And who will this generation represent, right? Her womb it becomes the womb of a nation, right? I did everything I could have done in the circumstances in which this was all going on. I threatened to complain. Quote, I shall tell your superiors. And the men said, these are their orders. The orders were to rape you. 
pages 52 to 53, the orders were to rape you. That's the title. That's where the title of the book comes from. Now, towards the end of the book, she has some of the poetry of a couple of these female tigers. And she also contrasts that with a poem from the Sangam period. All right, a poem from the Sangam period, going back to somewhere around the first, third century of the common era to see what distance has been traveled because that poem from the Sangam period talks about the heroic male warrior. But here, the poetry she's interested in is Tamil Elam women's war poetry. These women were and are warriors and she says they altered the world for Tamil women. Maybe they were involved in a conflict and did things they shouldn't have done, but they made possible a different vision for Tamil women. And I want to just conclude very briefly by reading out um, just a small portion of uh, uh, a poem. Um, well, this poem I can probably read read out in its entirety. It's called She, the Woman of Tamil Elam. The author of this book is Captain Vanathi. Captain Vanathi and Captain Kasturi, these are the two po female poets who are represented. Both of them died on 11-7-1991 in the famous Battle of Elephant Pass. This Elephant Pass is what linked uh, Vani, the northern mainland, uh, to the Jaffna Peninsula. And uh, here she has a poem from Captain uh, Vanati, uh, Vanati. The poem is called She, the Woman of Tamil Ila, not the red dot of the Kumkumam, but blood decorates her forehead. You do not see the sweetness of youth in her eyes, only the gravestones of the dead. Her lips don't utter useless babble, but the vows of martyrs. On her neck she wears not the thali, that marker of marriage, but a cyanide capsule. She embraces not men, but her weapons. Her legs do not wander in search of her relatives, but towards the liberation of Tamil Elam. The bullets from her gun will destroy the enemy. It will break the shackles, and then our people will sing our national anthem. It's, of course, the poetry of Tamil patriotism. But you can also call it the poetry of Tamil anti-colonialism, given the context. And Captain Kastur, Kasturi, the poem is short enough. I'll just read it and conclude. It's called Superpowers. Superpowers, in order to surge ahead, you torture others. When your power will be probed, it will be clear that developing countries were driven to destitution by you, for you to create a history on the moon, you strip and pillage and shame lands. Your coming only increases poverty and famine. The Red Cross of your land does not gather the wounded, they only care for inventory. Your country's researchers tabulate the statistics of deaths alongside stocks. Those peace-loving countries who have brokered deals with you have entered our land and only birth troubles as your airports expand, is it not our little huts that are set on fire, right? It's very interesting because this woman is able to place this conflict within the ambit of a larger geopolitics, right? You tactfully enter peaceful countries, cut their flourishing roots, and pour water on the stalks so they do not appear dead. Most often, your interventions are left behind only scorched earth. The AIDS that you spread is not even natural. Even wind and rain now suspect you. You are the international terrorists out to claim ownership of the artificial hurricanes that you will create. I think this book by Mira Kantasami, The Orders Were to Rape You, 
is worth a read. Thank you.